to the series with Dr. Jean Watson, Entering the Sacred Circle, Nursing's Covenant with Humanity. Dr. Jean Watson is a distinguished professor and Dean Emerita at the University of Colorado in Denver, where she held the nation's first endowed chair in caring science for 16 years. Dr. Watson is founder of the original Center for Human Caring in Colorado, a founding member of the International Association in Human Caring, and the founder and director of the nonprofit foundation, Watson Caring Science Institute. This series invites you into a deeper understanding of nursing as the sacred science of caring. In eight conversations with Dr. Watson, she offers her reflections on unitary caring in a time of global fracture. The focus of this series is on how new nursing graduates can situate their evolving practice in the sacred covenant between nursing and the healing of humanity. Conversation number five is about synthetic care. Simulation technology is being used increasingly as a platform not only to educate health practitioners, but to care for patients, particularly in extreme rural and remote geographical areas. In this session, Dr. Watson explores how synthetic care can be positioned as an effective means of caring while helping us to understand the influences of physical distance in caring for and about our patients, families, and communities. Dr. Watson, I'm wondering if you could start by defining synthetic care. Well, I think that's a term that's being used to as a substitute for simulated learning experiences where care is not done on a person that we would be taking care of, but it's a model or another student or that type of thing. So uh, it, it create or it's a it's a robot, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, so this too is part of the latest of you know simulation labs is having the finest technology and equipment for the body physical care that is um, needing to be taught in a variety of ways as part of education and learning procedures and so forth. So what is, is the challenge with this is how do you authenticate, so to speak, uh, the human to human caring when you're working with non-caring objects, uh, non-human objects. So part of the, way that some of this is being developed is one of my postdoctoral graduates, um, Roberta Christensen. She has been picking up on the notion of fidelity because one of the concepts in simulation lab is the concept of fidelity, making sure you have faithfulness with the technique and the procedure. But how do you have fidelity of caring is another way to address the missing piece in the simulation and in the synthetic care. So how you might do this is by helping the students to understand uh, and to create a learning experience in the laboratory where you actually can authenticate the human to human connection, where you can actually give students feedback on their authentic connection, their presence, their asking the right questions, their pausing, uh, so you could actually use these 10 Kiritas processes of, of loving kindness, of creating, uh, uh, picking up on the faith and hope and the belief system and the meaning of this experience for the patient, uh, become, get feedback on how sensitive you are to that person's whatever's been presented. Uh, how would you, how do you create a, a trusting relationship? What are some of the nonverbal and verbal cues that you're giving? So the educator and mentor can actually give feedback. Or if you have a patient model, that's another thing you could probably do more effectively than just the robotic care, is to actually have a person who then debriefs with the student and the faculty. And you have the post-conference sessions. And um, I remember Pam Jeffries, who's such a pro at the simulation work, I remember her saying, um, we were at a conference together in Saudi Arabia and she was describing how the most effective learning takes place outside of the simulation lab when you actually have the, the classroom and the circle of, the, of dialogue and learning from what you experience and get it, giving each other feedback. So that too is part of that human to human connection and the fidelity of the learning is really not just having the robot learning, 
in the lab, but having the post sessions where you actually have community of caring and critiquing with each other and trusting relationships to get feedback and so forth. So those are just some simple steps. But I think the other thing that I would say is that this also fits into the, um, the whole concept of what we were talking about in another session about the ethics of face that there's something about the importance of the human to human face to face physical connection that we can never fully substitute that through the telecommunication and through the simulation labs because we cannot evolve we we cannot survive alone without community without others so it's a paradox of its own it is a paradox you know i do uh, speaking of paradox um i feel like we we always sort of when we talk about sim and whatnot we we assume that it is a technology that interferes with or or, or perhaps doesn't optimize the opportunity to care but in your mind gene are are there ways that simulation actually can enhance our ability to teach the students how to care in in true face-to-face -face situations with their patients well, I think it's a dynamic process because you're going to, you know, it can be very helpful in teaching the learning skills and doing all this physical stuff that we need to learn and task and sort of the, the doing model. But we build need to build in the, the being model, the being with the doing is part of that technology. And it's even as you move into patient situation, it's nothing's wrong with technology. We need technology. We can't live without it now. And yet what happens if we do not have the consciousness or a theory or a philosophy or a value system to critique the technology, what happens is it depersonalizes both the person learning as well as the one receiving this robotic care or this technological care. But it takes the center of the experience away from the human and places it onto the technology. And when you have more and more technology for patients, you, you remove a continuity of a primary relationship and you have more and more people coming in to take care of the technology and it interrupts the unity or the trust and the, um, the, the synchronicity of oneness with having some primary care delivery. So it interrupts the pattern of relationships when you have more and more people who are just technicians coming in to check on the tech on the technology without connecting with the person and if the students are not taught in the beginning how to mediate both and and the faculty are not able to help them mediate both and then you're actually perpetuating by preparing nurses to go in and conform to the technology and to become um, more technically oriented and becoming technicians instead of professional nurses Wow, you know, all I can think about is my own critical care experience um, and the research I've done with new graduates in emergency where they haven't actually as yet developed this, this sort of default approach where they can go beneath or beyond or around the technology to get to the person. And they, if you don't have a way to help them to do that as new graduates, what I've seen is an adoption of a, a really mechanistic technocratic approach to patient care that, that in some situations in my research, it resulted in that nurse recognizing in themselves and other people recognizing in them this objectification and depersonalization of their care mm -hmm. uh, and so I just think in those areas and I guess regardless of whether or not it's with a new nurse but I do think the new nurse has not yet had that opportunity mm -hmm. to figure out how to do that regardless of I'm facing a patient with nothing but drips and, and machines and how do I get to the patient through those machines, how do I do that? I, I think in ICUs and emergency rooms and whatnot, this idea that you're talking about, how do we help the nurses on a day-to-day -day basis frame their care so that they don't end up moving so far from the patient? I think they learn, they, they learn from the models in the system. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So experienced nurses yes. perpetuating a very robotic technological approach to patient care in ICU or any unit, then that's what they learn. That's what they conform to. So it really takes a consciousness and it takes a courage for a student nurse or a new graduate to even ask new questions because they don't want to interrupt that conformity and that system, that culture that they are seeing is the way they're doing things. So it's such a, a challenge because on the one hand, they have this consciousness, they have this ideal, they have this awareness that there's a disconnect, but they don't quite have the standing to raise questions about it. They, first of all, they have to be comfortable in that unit. You know, we started some, pro this is another thing that maybe helps with the partnerships between education and practice. Because one of the things we did years ago when I was Dean, we had created what we called clinical teaching associates. They were staff nurses, bachelors and masters prepared who were nominated or applied to be clinical teaching associates. And our undergraduate students were al aligned with the clinical teaching session who were experts in that field, in that unit, in that system, in that care model. And then we had programs every month where the CTAs would come to the university and we would have this whole network of these clinical teaching associates from these different hospitals learning about the curriculum and what we were preparing with their students in the clinical, I mean, in the education setting. And it just... It, students loved it mm. because they had confident people who were who knew the curriculum, who knew our values and philosophy were emerging values, and they had a confident nurse there in the system, not a faculty member who comes and floats and comes and goes is not there so, associated with that. So that was a very powerful way of bridging this gap that I would encourage more and more educational and clinical settings to em emulate something similar to this. Yeah, I, 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 I hear two things, right? Making sure that we do, we have some sort of bridging from uh, the healthcare sector back to education as we are developing these young nurses and giving them the skills to, to get through that technology to the person. Um, and then when they get into practice, they need these good models. And, and so we need to support the senior nurses to continue to, frame their care in a way that allows them to move uh, through that um, technological, you know, um, uh, interruption and get to the individuals that they're caring for in ways that you've obviously described the sutras, the keratus processes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a, a wonderful uh, frame for talking about synthetic care. Are there any final thoughts that you have well, the other way that I think about it is, um, you know, we have created this scenario and we do it in the lab, the simulation lab, as well as in the clinical setting where person gets reduced to patient and then patient gets reduced to body physical and body physical gets reduced to machine or technology. And that's the paradigm of simulation lab. And so when you have that scenario and that's what you're educating in that framework, then we're creating a model by which a human gets reduced to the moral status of an object through the technological approach alone. So which calls for and really requires the ethical, moral, relational worldview to be built in along with the simulation lab so that you can bring the fullness of the person with the technology together. So that's another way of understanding and critiquing the limitations if we are not able to ask new questions and build in the fidelity of the caring nurse and the caring response from the patient if we don't, if we just only adhere to the technology alone. Well said, Jean. Thank you so much. It was a great it's pleasure, session. Judy. I'm enjoying this so much. You're a wonderful uh, moderator for these sessions, so I'm privileged. Thank you. It's a, obviously a privilege to spend this time with you. Thank you so much, Jean. My pleasure.